shapeshift. With no account or signup required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, Dash, Nubits, Monero, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Volturo, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Volturo.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with an old friend of ours, Sean Jones. She's been on the show quite a few times to talk about her favorite topic, which is regulation. And it's been a while that we did the last episode on regulation, but quite a few things have happened since then. So we wanted to have her back on to sort of dive into these topics. Thanks for joining us today, Sean. Well, you're very welcome. It's always huge fun being uh, being on the show with you guys. Um, you know, you're making me start to feel like an old piece of furniture. I mean, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> comfortable, no, comfortable, and 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 you're used to. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, and I'm not, nice I'm not sure that I would describe regulation as my favorite topic, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the, the one I know about. <laughs> Nice t-shirt, by the way. Oh, yes, my epicenter Bitcoin <laughs> one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Couldn't wear anything else. Right, yeah, I think it's interesting because when we got started, we kept talking about regulation. It came up again and again and again, and then I think it sort of faded a bit into the background in our programming. I'm not exactly sure why. I think there was a lot of news at the time, and maybe the news has decreased a bit, although there would be a whole lot to talk about today. And maybe also it's just the same story over and over, and there's a lot of repetition, right? Like I was going make... to say, you, you know, you just get bored of listening to me talking about <laughs> regulation. <laughs> I mean, it's just often when you have some, for example, with these guidances, like someone makes a statement, then the next person makes a statement, or next bank or central bank or something, and it tends to be pretty much a word-by-word -word copy of the previous guy. So... Um, there's, but there's, a, there's today, a lot of there's a lot of that. That's for sure. But there have been things to, that we talked about in the past. Some of them have come to fruition of late, or coming to fruition. And so it's kind of, I won't call it exciting because I don't think that's quite the case. But it's certainly um, having an impact on the industry. Right. But so today will be a bit different because there are, I think, a few really big news that aren't just sort of statements uh, about some opinions or something. And the most important, of course, is bit license which was announced, when was that, two years ago? Is it? Uh, no, it would say, believe it, it or not, it's it was a only year? a year ago, it was June, uh, June last, uh, June last, last year. year. And um, uh, there was all this huge um, commotion at the time, right? a lot of interest in the Bitcoin community, and now it's actually in force, and it seems to have sort of gone without much attention that that's happened. Um, but. For people who aren't too familiar, can you give a sort of a very brief um, description of what the bit license regulations are? Um, sure. So this is um, New York State's own um, own set of regulation. They they were first out of their starting block by. Um, first of all, having hearings on this new stuff of digital currency and that started at the beginning of last year and by the summer of last year 2014 they decided to uh, to issue some draft regulations and I say some they were if I remember correctly the first version of it had um, about 40 pages of regulation and undoubtedly incredibly wide in scope and um, and, and really in most people's opinion, burdensome and rather too vague in ways that sort of it tried to catch absolutely everything. And surprisingly went over and above a lot of federal regulation. So um, it seemed on the face of it to duplicate um, uh, certainly some of the uh, money laundering provisions and indeed make them more onerous so that you had to do them sort of for uh, um, for, 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 for federal um, authorities, the, the, the FinCEN is the 
is the government agency that that deals with that, and also for New York State. Uh, so it, it was very costly, very burdensome, um, very wide in its terminology, and extremely um, vague in some areas. So that it, you know, when you've got definitions that are broad, very um, all encompassing. You, but but somehow not precise enough. So they 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 put it out for consultation or for feedback. Uh, initially, there was a forty five day period that ran, if I remember correctly, till September last year, and they extended it because they they had, um, I believe, uh, well over a thousand um, uh, items of uh, feedback coming in. Some quite long, some quite short, some very um, sort of academic, and some just generally from members of the public who just didn't like it. Um, and, and so they extended that, and that ran into about October time, into the autumn. And uh, they took a lot of that on board and came out with a second set of, um, uh, a second draft, if you like. And that came out at the beginning of this year, 2015. And uh, there was a further period of uh, feedback and um, as a result of that they did some fine tuning and uh, in June they published June 2015 they published the final version this is the regulation this is the rule or set of rules it's still something in 40 odd pages so it's still pretty extensive they tightened up on a lot of the um, a lot of the provisions in there a lot of the detail and um, the, the, the result is that uh, it's on the kind of um, um, on the book since uh, the end of um, the end of June. So we're recording this in July, and uh, folks have forty-five days. So only until um, the first part of August uh, to get their applications in if they're caught by the regulations. So. That's the background. And I think one, one of the key takeaways about what you just said is that the, the, the cost and burdensomeness of this regulation is just, I mean, it, it, it is very uh, uh, wide encompassing and in in, in vague in what it uh, talks about in, in, in the document. And, um, and it, you know, it just seems like there's no way that this is going to allow any type of innovation within the space. I mean, I don't see how any anyone is going to be able to build anything uh, if they're going to be regulated by, like, licensed by BitLicense or uh, want to play in the regulated uh, space. It is burdensome. It's very broad. It's quite, in spite of the um, number of iterations it's gone through it's still not as precise as um, as uh, a lot of people would like um, there's been fair degree of criticism at the um, at, at some of the definitions um, the scope is still quite woolly they've, they've, they've been more precise in the in the first version they took out uh, they had um, or it could have been construed that they were including, say, software companies that were developing um, applications uh, for virtual currencies, and they 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 clarified that and and took out the um, took out those kind of provisions. So they, they they did a bit to narrow it down, but it's still extremely broad and, and vague. I think if we, if we take if you look at the sort of larger picture, right? The, the United States uh, likes to call itself sort of the land of the free, and, and this is strong idea of like free markets and capitalism and competition and, and and all that stuff. And then if you read this thing, it's just a complete joke. <laughs> like this is like you could easily have seen a country like North Korea writing something like that, because there's just like nothing of that in there. Because it, it's it's essentially gives complete power to this superintendent to say who's allowed to do business, how are they allowed to do business, and, and there, there are clauses in there, it just made me uh, incredible. That there's one, nothing in this part shall be construed as limiting any power granted to the superintendent under any provision. So, so something I gave, uh, and then another one is 
I think, a, a crazy provision as well that, you know, one has to get permission if one ever changes the product or, or makes a new product or any material changes. And then, of course, the question is, what are material changes? And, and then there's this definition there. So a material change may occur when a change is proposed to an existing product, service or activity that may cause such product, service or activity to be materially different. So a material change is making something materially different. <laughs> of course, that does not limit at all like what the Mr. Superintendent can call a material change. So I, I think it is, uh, it is quite crazy. But for example, any, any merger and acquisition has to be approved by the superintendent. And he has to judge that somehow this is in the interest of the public. Of course, there's no standard for saying what it is. So he can do whatever he wants. Uh, and I, I mean, I am quite frankly, I think this is, this is just crazy. And this is just the beginning, right? Because uh, if, if other states start adopting regulations like this, then you potentially face with a situation where every, you have to be licensed in every one of the states. And oh. different states might have different provisions like this, which, you know, may vary. Um, uh, material change may uh, mean one thing in one state or another. Yeah, well, let me throw in another one, which I also thought was sort of crazy. So, right, one of the things is when you get regulated, you have to, each key, each employee has to, like, submit, like, 10 years of their work history and the criminal record and the fingerprints and the, and the photograph to the FBI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, then the superintendent is going to judge whether he sees the qualities in that person to run such a business. I mean, that is just crazy. So this person is going to look at one's record and says, uh, you know, do you have the necessary character qualities to do business? That is, that is, I, I find that so absurd. And I think it's so, like, what are we left with here? I mean, either one has to say that this narrative of the United States as this free market capitalism, liberty loving country is just complete bogus. Uh, or maybe there's something big that I'm missing here. Well, it's one of, one of the problems is for us in Europe uh, uh, is that we have an entirely different system that is based on um, legislation that comes from the top and regulators just um, execute it. And there tends not to be anything like the... Um, sort of the discretionary powers that are granted to our regulators in Europe. Whereas in the States, um, a lot of power is devolved to, uh, to regulators as supervisors. So the New York Department of Financial Services, the, the superintendent, who was um, Ben Lorsky, who, who kicked this thing off, he's now actually just moved on. His sort of final act was to uh, um, announce the the final version of the and, license. And this he went off. That what he has moved on was to advise companies <laughs> how to comply with these crazy regulations, no? Because, uh, I, I mean, I think in any democratic country, that should be illegal, <laughs> no? I mean, well, of course, we don't exactly know, uh, you know exactly what he's going to be doing in, 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 in his new role, but he's certainly gone into private practice. Right. And, if you talk uh, about the conflict of interest, I think we have a, a, a wonderful example of, of a conflict of interest here. Well, I've, I've heard all sorts of things uh, said uh, uh, about his uh, ultimate ambitions. Um, in, in the USA, you have to remember that... Um, a lot of these appointments are political in nature, and uh, sometimes um, it's it's a pathway to a political career. So, I I, I think you might uh, might extrapolate from that some some thoughts about uh, the, the 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 direction that 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 this has gone in and is going in uh, might might sort of be born out of some of that. Um, I'm not suggesting for one moment that, um, you know, that it, 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 it's not, a, this is a subject that has to be looked at everywhere in the world is looking at it, and um, indeed throughout the US. But I, I, let me pick up on uh, one of Sebastian's points. The, um, the reality in the States is it's 50 jurisdictions plus the federal government. So, um, 
each state makes its own laws and so far as its own sort of domestic arrangements are concerned is perfectly free to do that. So here we've got New York as a major global financial center. Um, interestingly enough, smaller, uh, a smaller jurisdiction um, in sort of global terms than say California. Um, uh, but but you know it, it it's it's a it's a global financial center and so it's uh, it it's got a lot of responsibility. This um, superintendent's role is responsible for banking and insurance and financial services, and that accounts for businesses that I believe control somewhere around about six billion dollars um, uh, of, of assets or something of that order. I mean, a, a very six, significant six trillion, you probably. Oh, six trillion. Sorry, forgive me. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. Sorry, six trillion, which is which is a lot of t a big telephone number, and uh, you know, a lot of focus is on on it as a financial a, a financial center, and it's perfectly right that they should consider it. Um, the reality is that each of the different states will take a different view. So um, New York's first out of the starting block. California, uh, maybe we'll have a moment to talk about that later on, but California are doing something, but on an entirely different scale. Um, and uh, other states have started to address the subject, and most of the states are looking at it, and some of them are looking at what might now become the the New York model, and may decide to 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 follow New York. Others may prefer to take a more um, a lighter touch approach and be competitive with New York. Actually, use this as an opportunity to 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 take some financial business away from New York. And I think that's a consequence we're going to see from what's going on at the moment. There are some notable businesses that have uh, said that they are going to quit New York and um, either move to other parts of the USA or move overseas. Um, one, so this one, is a trend we'll see. One of the questions that are, that's very interesting when you talk about exactly that question, you know, is there a competition between different jurisdictions, be between different regulatory frameworks, is what's the scope of this bit license? And I think that's also one of the one of the aspects that I personally find so offensive, like living not in the US, that, uh, you know, something like bit license really has that sort of understanding that, well, this is applies anywhere in the world as long as there may be a New York resident or customer or something like that. So can you speak a little bit about what does that actually mean? Does that mean only it's not because it's not just startups in New York, right? It's also startups somewhere else that have New York customers. Uh, will it work to just block IP addresses? Do you have a view there? Yes, um, you raise an extremely interesting point. The the definition of um, a virtual currency business activity, which is basically what um, uh, if you conduct any of these you you need to get a bit licensed and what it actually says is that it uh, this term virtual currency business activity means the conduct of any one of the following types of activities involving New York or a New York resident so there's already um, a, a pretty wide scope because um, you know it's not just about New Yorkers uh, in the sense that they're people who are resident there, but in in any other way involving New York. And this is very wide and as, as far as I'm aware has never been tested. It's, it's, it's a very broad term. So any one of the following types of activities involving New York or a New York resident. One, receiving virtual currency for transmission or transmitting virtual currency, um, except where the transaction is undertaken for non-financial purposes and does not involve um, the transfer of more than a nominal amount of virtual currency. And I don't believe that nominal is um, is sort of defined anywhere. So that's going to be an interesting one. Are we talking about, you know, a dollar's worth or a hundred dollars worth or a thousand dollars worth? What, what's nominal? Um, and the second activity is that of storing, holding or maintaining custody or control of virtual currency on behalf of others. So 
that's actually quite a good one in a way because it's essentially talking about um, pe uh, a, a, a virtual currency, a digital currency business that's looking after other people's money or holding other people's money, if you want to think of it in those terms. And, and it's probably right that there should be some standards for that if you think about um, losses that have occurred, whether through fraud or through just um, inadequate uh, protection measures or being managed by people who just didn't understand the, the extent to which they were going to be responsible for other people's um, assets. Um, if you think about some of those cases over the last, um, over the history of Bitcoin to date, then that's probably a good thing. And, the, and then the third thing um, is that of buying and selling virtual currency as a customer business. So that's uh, essentially um, exchange activities, I guess, um, if you think about it. And um, the fourth case is um, 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 where it's actually mentioned that, that, that it covers exchange services as a customer business. I suppose there are some differences there. I suppose trading might be uh, different. or And this is the really uh, quite um, worrying one in one sense, um, and that is controlling, administering, or issuing a, a, a virtual currency. So there's this question of you know who, who controls it, who administers it, or who issues it. Well, issue is probably quite easy in decentralized world. Nobody issues it, but um, controlling is 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 a little worrying. Um, Will that affect miners? Th there is a strong possibility. Yes, um, I think that that is um, that is one um, one concern, and indeed, at least one of the major mining pools announced that it was closing on the back of that particular provision. So. At the moment, the feeling is that yes, it does include miners. I want to point out that uh, regarding you know, what you just the, the the statement, New York resident. Let's let's uh, read what it says about New York resident. So, a New York resident is a person that resides, is located, has a place of business, or is conducting business in New York. So, you could simply be a tourist in New York because you're located there. Uh, from what I understand, or it, you could be conducting business in New York on something completely unrelated. So you could yes. be perhaps a Canadian and living in Canada, have never set foot in New York and have a digital currency business and conducting business with someone in New York on something completely unrelated. Maybe you're just, I don't know, buying shoes uh, <laughs> on some website. I mean, this is the, this is the point. We don't, um, we don't really know how extensive this involvement um, provision is. Um, but you're quite right. Um, it's generally felt that involving New York um, is um, extremely broad and will capture an awful lot of um, people who are engaged in virtual currency businesses, even though they are not in New York, and even though the people that they're doing business with are not New Yorkers, but where there might inadvertently be some unrelated um, uh, relationship with, uh, with, with New York. The consequence of that, of course, is what you end up being, right, is, is that no business will be able, or almost no business will be able to be totally sure that they're not violating the license, right? So every, every, every startup in this space will have maybe some, even if it's small, some risk that they, they could be actually uh, falling under the license, and of course, mm -hmm. it's always cases like, well, if they don't like somebody, they they can go and look very closely at at that specific company, find some way they violating the license, or they should actually be regulated, but they didn't, and and go after them, which I think is is extremely extremely worrying. Can we just point? Can we just make the point that this regulation was written for exactly that purpose? Can can we agree on that? I mean, um, for the most part, I think that the, the, the fact that it's so vast and so uh, uh, vague in its terms specifically will make it possible for New York regulators to go after people that they don't like or that they perhaps don't agree with uh, political ideas or uh, business ideas or what, what have you. It is common in U.S financial regulation and in the laws uh, affecting finance, money, payments, to be global in scope. 
It's a particular perspective that is taken by America. It has a number of other laws that are effectively global in nature. There's been a lot of um, emphasis in the last um, three or four years over a piece of legislation about money that Americans might hold in banks anywhere else in the world and making those banks in other parts of the world responsible in various ways. So it's, it's an outlook. It's a particular outlook which, um, uh, which certainly those of us in Europe are unfamiliar with. We, we tend to think about jurisdictions as looking after their own and not trying to reach globally. It's an imperialist outlook. I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> Some right. people might consider that that's that is the those are acts of uh, of uh, of of financial imperialism or they're about modern modern imperialism certainly. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins, and they now support over thirty of the most popular altcoins, including. Dash, Swarm, Peercoin, Vertcoin, Dogecoin, Gems, and so many others. The list just goes on. When you want to trade some altcoins, forget about using exchange. What, do you still use a Walkman? No, that's so 20, like, that's not even 20. That's like 1995, man. Just go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or sign up required. Here's how it works. You head over to shapeshift.io. You choose the currency you want to sell. Let's say you want to get rid of some Bitcoins and the currency you want to buy, let's say you want to buy Dogecoin, you then simply send the Bitcoins to the Shapeshift address, they exchange it for you and put the Dogecoins directly into your wallet. Super easy, boom, done, no account, nothing required. By the way, uh, Shapeshift has just been running an equity crowd sale campaign, so you were actually able to buy equity in Shapeshift, unless you're American. And uh, you can check that out if you're interested at banktothefuture.com. That's B-N-K, dothefuture.com. We'll put a link in the show notes. So thanks so much for their support. And you can give it a try and trade some altcoins, trade some coins on shapeshift.io. I'd like to also touch on the, the cost uh, of, uh, of becoming licensed under BitLicense. So it says that uh, each applicant must submit an additional application fee in the amount of $5,000 to cover the cost of processing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and uh, so these license fees um, will not be reimbursed in the event that the license doesn't go through. So if, if the application process is rejected. Um, so if, if we look to the, to the future and perhaps uh, you know California has a regulation and who knows, like next it's Texas and other other states, and uh, next thing you know, I don't know, some country in Europe starts uh, having uh, licensing as well, and and as a company, you now have to upfront all this money to uh, become licensed in all these jurisdictions because they are so vast, and in any case, you need to be uh, ensure that you're abiding by the law in each of those jurisdictions. Wouldn't that just make it completely impossible for any startup uh, to even come to existence. But the, the real cost is, is not the $5,000. <laughs> the real cost is, is hiring the lawyers and, and hiring the staff that's, that's going to write these that, manuals yeah. and policies and complying with that. And I mean, that is, is going to be, I mean, I don't know if you have any estimates, but I mean, it seems, we, it seems we, like to do that properly, it will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a yes. year. You see, you don't need me on this show. You know all about <laughs> regulation and the implications. Uh, you're absolutely right. The cost of five thousand is the is is the smallest item of expense. Some people think it's a, it's a it's a it's a pricey application fee, um, and 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 indeed, you know, you've got annual renewal fees, and you've got uh, when you get your periodic uh, examinations, and they come and check you out, you have to pay. Um, fees for, for that and so on and so forth. But all of those are the smallest part of the cost. Some of the requirements um, uh, have very expensive uh, implications. You're required to have um, uh, competent um, uh, compliance professionals. You've got to have a compliance officer. You have to have anti-money laundering professionals, people who are experienced in that field. And you have to have a chief information security officer and have, um, although they've lightened up a little bit on the security provisions, it's still very heavy on cybersecurity uh, requirements. Um, and so when you 
total up all of those kind of costs. And let's bear in mind that um, compliance is not something that's just uh, in the crypto world. Um, financial services generally have had to uh, beef up on uh, on their compliance staff uh, in terms of numbers, and uh, and so it's become uh, very much the 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 job du jour. It's the uh, it's, it's, it's a good profession to be in, and uh, the, the top professionals command uh, very high salaries. Um, so when you start adding all those costs up, you're probably looking at a uh, quarter of a million to half a million uh, US dollars um, uh, a year would, would, would certainly, in, to my mind, not be uh, far off the mark. Obviously, it depends on your business model, and it depends on, um, it does depend on your um, it, dep it depends on your business and on your scale and various other things as to quite where that cost sits. But it certainly will penalize the small businesses, although there has been some concession there. In the first draft, there were, that, you know, it was like um, it was all or nothing. And um, there was a lot of criticism. And they have given a sort of version, I like to think of it as sort of bit a bit license light, uh, a sort of um, a provisional license for startups. But the, the costs are still going to be hefty there's no doubt about it certainly for a, a, a you know a very small startup so our, our one of our sponsors right shapeshift they they were i think the first company or, mm. or maybe the best known company to announce yeah. that they're they're leaving new york of course it makes perfect sense you no know, with their product because their product is it's very easy to exchange cryptocurrencies if you start to have to do kyc on every person they would uh, make an awful product um so first of all, how can startups avoid being affected by bit license? Is is blocking IP addresses is that going to be effective or is that going to be insufficient? And and do you see that? Do you have some insight in other startups how they are reacting? Other companies how they're responding to the bit license? Well, I, in in spite of the fact that we've been talking about it on two or three shows and others, of course, it's received a lot of publicity in the in the in the, in the virtual currency media, I don't think enough businesses have really been um, considering uh, the implications. Um, you, you, you're very right. I mean, companies like Shapeshift, um, who are a crypto-to-crypto -crypto business, um, they are also caught by these provisions. So this isn't just about fiat-to-crypto or crypto-to-fiat. It, it, it encompasses um, crypto-to-crypto. And um, and so uh, you know it 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 becomes very difficult to comply with some of the provisions um, at all. It just isn't vi it isn't possible. So um, it's going to cover people um, globally because you really don't know if the person you're dealing with is a New York resident or some way involving New York. So you could be, you know, if you geo-blocked uh, New York IP addresses, well, what happens if uh, someone from, from New York happens to be visiting um, Los Angeles when he or she um, performs a transaction? So your IP address is, um, is, is a Californian IP address. So, um, you know, you've got blocking uh, geo-blocking isn't going to be sufficient. But, but the, I guess the question would be then, is, is that enough of a, can you then say, well, I tried, right? So, and Oh, no. No, no, that's no. not good enough. No, it's an all or nothing. It's absolute. And if you, if you inadvertently, um, if you inadvertently uh, uh, breach one of these provisions and you perform a transaction um, when you should have been licensed and you weren't licensed, then I'm afraid um, uh, they'll, 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 you know, it's a, it's an offence, and it, it, as far as I understand it, um, it's, it's potentially a jailable offence, and certainly a finable offence. And um, uh, you know, USA is is quite aggressive at trying to um, uh, trying to make examples of people outside its jurisdiction, um, outside its territory, I should say, but within what it treats as its jurisdiction which is and, uh, and ca well yes and, and and in gambling there have been cases where folks have been um 
in, you know, indicted and um, they've tried to have them extradited from other countries or when they were passing through the US and didn't even realize that they'd um, uh, fallen foul of some um, some law or regulation uh, have then uh, arrested them on landing in in the US. Um, this has happened a number of times. Um, if you remember in the case of Liberty Reserve, so that's kind of a related industry, um, they closed down businesses and their bank accounts all over the world and sought to arrest people in a number of jurisdictions and sought the cooperation of those other jurisdictions, law enforcement and so on and so forth. So ignoring this stuff or thinking that, you know, I'm too small and I'm not in America and I'll do my best by just geo-blocking uh, New York IP addresses or even US IP addresses um, may not be sufficient. Today's magic word is imperial, I-M-P-E-R-I-A-L. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in Enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward. One one topic that hasn't uh, wasn't discussed or mentioned in the bit license is multisig, and of course multisig makes this whole thing a little bit more complicated because you know, for example, a custodianship is a regulated activity. But what happens now if you split that custodianship uh, among several parties and none of them can actually use or, or access the customer's fund without permission of one of the other parties? So what do you think this means for multi-sig providers? Well, this is one of the areas of vagueness that when you know, those of us in the uh, compliance and colleagues in the legal profession are a bit concerned about because uh, if you look at the terminology of New York's bit license, um, it seems to be suggesting that any measure of control, so if you're just one signatory and you're based in New York, then you're caught by it. Or indeed, if you one party is involved, is, 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 is involved with New York or is a New York resident and so on, uh, and so you'd be caught by it. Whereas under, this is where we start to see all these little subtle differences. The California legislation, which is not yet enacted, but, but getting close, um, has taken a different approach and, um, uh, and uh, has been more precise and refers to full control. So full control means, we believe, is probably to be interpreted as being total control. So a single signatory on a single SIG wallet um, whereas on a multi-sig wallet, um, you know, that's not, no one party has full control and so uh, you would fall outside of the provision. So New York looks very much like it doesn't take any regard to being multi-sig or single-sig, whereas other jurisdictions are starting to differentiate. Now on the, on the topic of control, uh, I, it, I mean, it brings to my mind the, the idea of smart contracts and if you have smart contracts that um, initiate machine-to-machine -machine payments uh, or in, in, the, in the area of Internet of Things. So for example, you have a smartwatch, which is uh, I mean, maybe not a smartwatch, but maybe like a, a washing machine sending money to uh, a, a, a service provider or um, a repair uh, facility. Then who's to be regulated? I mean, well, I actually I saw a provision that uh, applies to exactly that, which says uh, a bill license company is not allowed to do business with anybody that doesn't have a, a physical location somewhere. Yes, I mean you're touching on a on on something that will become increasingly interesting over the coming years, Sebastian. That is the whole um, question of the the. the capacity, if you like, of devices, the legal capacity of devices to enter into binding contract. You know, are they agents of the people who own them or who possess them or uh, uh, if they're free thinking? And I suppose you could take this, extend this to the whole concept of, uh, of artificial intelligence and so on. These things that are free thinking um, would be 
um, uh, free thinking or independently thinking is perhaps a better way of putting it. I mean, not even thinking. It's just the fact that they're that they're an automated and autonomous actor. I mean, they could not be thinking at all; just be completely autonomous. I mean, you could have right, a very well, simple program that, that, that doesn't yes. really have any intelligence, but is autonomous and can interact with others. Well, and so is it the agent of the person who sort of set it up because they take responsibility for what it is going to do? But of course, um, it's impossible. Well, to, but to there, so then it. does it have some? Well, that's of course another matter entirely. You're absolutely right. There's there's a lot of academic debate at the moment about uh, on this very topic, and um, it's going to be very interesting. I think the law will do what it always ends up doing in uh, eventually, and that is catching up with technology. Um, technology is changing how things are transacted, and. Um, uh, eventually the law will have to catch up and decide how to treat it. At what point does, um, does a, a device in the Internet of Things um, you know, take responsibility? Can it, of course, take responsibility? Of course, it can't in the sense that we know it today. So in a world where everybody is accountable, how do you make someone accountable for the actions of a device? Um, who knows? I mean, this is... Uh, this is new territory, and um, it will keep lawyers very busy. I'm sure it will. Um, so you mentioned the California license, which yes. is currently in... in it's going what, through in, the legislative in, in, process. Yeah. Right, so it's, in, I guess, in a draft uh, process right now. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a proposed piece of legislation. So um, uh, an assemblyman... Uh, in California has um, drafted, he's actually the, the committee chair of, I think, the Banking and Finance Committee, something like that, and he has drafted a piece of legislation that was published uh, around uh, February time, uh, February this year, 2015, and um, has been working its way through the various stages. Um, so it's passed through the Assembly, which is the lower house uh, of the legislature, and it's already had its first reading um, and a committee reading and some amendments in the Senate, the upper house. So it is uh, probably, I guess, somewhere about three quarters of the way through becoming law. It's, um, it's been, um, it was considerably lighter in volume than the New York equivalent. So we're talking about if, if New York's was something like 40 pages, I think when it first came out, the California one was about four pages. Um, it doesn't attempt to address um, most matters. It's more ab about trying to bring uh, virtual currency businesses into the same realm as money transmitter businesses. Um, so trying to find the parallels and bring them into a similar licensing si uh, system. Uh, so essentially that's for consumer protection purposes. It doesn't really address any issues of cyber security and um, um, anti-money laundering. The, 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 there are other provisions for dealing with some of those things in other pieces of legislation. Um, it doesn't attempt to duplicate things that are addressed by federal agencies, so things like the money laundering issues that are addressed by FinCEN. It's not trying to duplicate those things within the state in the way that New York has done. And um, some of the revisions as it's gone through the legislature have been to um, uh, sharpen it up. Uh, so, for example, this reference that we just talked about to um, uh, full control is, um, is uh, uh, really very helpful in the virtual currency world. Um, absolutely deals with the situation of uh, multi-signature in a good way um, and says basically, you know, you're not actually responsible for somebody else's money if you haven't got full control of it. So that, that's good. Um, it dropped the provision for, um, for exchanges. Um, uh, so it's basically just uh, as a separate activity. So it's only about whether or not a business is holding other people's money. That's that's just the issue, and whether it's do whether that entity is doing it in the state of California. So it it, it did start life by referring to residents of California. Um, 
not nearly as wide as New York's involving California, but involving um, California residents. But even that in the latest draft has been um, uh, taken out and it's been replaced by uh, simply the activities being carried out in California. So, so the, the business has to be in... It's, a ca it's for Californian businesses. I mean, that, that, that sounds, a, that sounds a money. lot more reasonable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Much tighter, much uh, clearer, much simpler, uh, much more appropriate, not trying to uh, be all things to all people, but rather just saying, you know, other similar types of business have to be licensed. And um, there are obviously provisions for uh, um, uh, minimum capital and uh, uh, keeping uh, money uh, either bonding other people's money or, or providing uh, surety for it or putting it in, in, in a certain kind of account that is, uh, you know, not, uh, that is fairly safe. But these are kind of common sense things that you would expect to see in most, uh, where there are financial intermediaries. Uh, so yes, much, much more pragmatic and much better, much more appropriate. One of the interesting things about California is that it's a very large jurisdiction. You know, California is the largest uh, um, uh, GDP of any of the U.S. states. Um, and, uh, you know, it ranks uh, somewhere around, approximately around number 10, in, if it were a country in its own right. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, out of 180, 190 jurisdictions around the world, if you were to insert individual U.S. states in there, California would be in the top 10. New York f comes up at around about, I don't know, somewhere around about India or somewhere like that. Number 14, 15, 16, something like that. Our show today is brought to you by Voltura.com, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Now, when you live in Berlin or in France or in a lot of comfortable places like the US, etc., we often forget that when you put money in the bank, you don't actually control it anymore and it's not really yours. So when things go wrong, do you still have access to it? Maybe, maybe not. And I think the Greece thing has that really illustrated that. And it's illustrated that some forms of money are protected from that. And Bitcoin's one of them, and gold is one of them. That's right. If you want to start buying some gold, you can do that very easily with Valtoro.com. You can start trading as little as one milligram of gold. And you don't even need to do any KYC if you're buying less than $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day. So that just eliminates all barriers to entry. So, And the, the gold that you buy on Voltoro belongs to you. It doesn't belong to Voltoro. It doesn't belong to some third party. You own the gold legally. So go to Voltoro.com and start trading some gold today. And we would just like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. What's interesting is just the contrast between New York, which is traditionally a financial sector, and California, which has a history of tech startups and innovation, and the 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 depth in which this regulation goes and tries to either control or not, you know, people's activities. Absolutely. Imagine the complexity with all those uh, uh, Silicon Valley startups and all the Silicon Valley based VC companies that have invested in, in uh, uh, Bitcoin and, and blockchain companies. Uh, think about all the people who are now employed in California in this industry. It would be really complicated and, and um, foolish and foolish yes they'd be shooting themselves in the foot and sending loads of companies away although some have even on the basis of this lightweight um, regulation perhaps not entirely because of california but because of things that are going on in the u.s generally have upped sticks and and left and the most notable one of those is uh, zappo who um uh, a month or two ago did, uh, announced they were uh, upping sticks and relocating to Switzerland. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see where all of this is going. I think we're 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 starting to see um, jurisdiction um, becoming an issue so far as regulation is concerned. So when you've got a startup and you've got a startup um, that, that's just getting off the ground, it has to think carefully about you know where the costs are going to enable it to to innovate freely and without being burdensome you know you want your money for development your startup money for development and marketing you don't want to spend it on 
on getting licensed. And then when businesses are starting to scale up, they're thinking about which jurisdictions are going to allow them to operate in a very cost-effective way. And they've got to balance um, the considerations of where it's possible to, to operate cost-effectively with where the markets are. And at the moment, the biggest markets for uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin-related services, um, that market is without question uh, the USA and North America generally. So, so touching again on, on light touch regulation, not to spend too much time on this because we do have other topics to, to, uh, to cover, uh, the Canadian Senate issued a report uh, on uh, virtual currencies which uh, proposes a lighter touch at, uh, at cryptocurrency revolution. Um, regulation uh and um and and perhaps this light touch is is most notably illustrated by the wonderful um canadian humor on the front cover which is digital currency you can't flip this coin <laughs> yes and, and and there's a lovely contrast um uh, between the the seriousness of uh, of the u.s and new york in particular and this uh um, tongue-in-cheek approach um, the, from north of the of the border with Canada. Yes, well, absolutely. you know, as Canadians, we're not too we don't take ourselves too seriously in any case. <laughs> well, and and what's really interesting is that Canada came out very early on with sort of uh, concerns about money laundering and sort of set up some enabling provisions and has, as far as I'm aware, yet to to do anything with it. Meanwhile. Um, I think it was a referral by the government to um, to the Senate asking it to one of its committees, its banking committee, to uh, take a look at virtual currencies, digital currencies, and um, and it did so for about three or four months and came out very recently with a report. And the conclusion on that report was that um, uh, this stuff is is basically. Um, innovation. Uh, it has a lot of benefits. Um, it can improve not only the financial system, but probably also the way that government functions. And essentially, um, whilst recognizing that there are some uh, money laundering concerns, it essentially recommends to government that it should uh, take a more uh, a very balanced approach and give some breathing space and there's a kind of implication of about three years breathing space uh to it's nice that we have to do this we have those uh, those messages as contrast as well if um, i had a little canadian flag i'd be waving it right now yeah. i i i well of course the it's only a committee's report albeit right. senators are are important people but but you know they uh, that they're not the executive but uh, one imagines that the government will probably um, is likely, I think, to 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 follow that and take uh, and give more breathing space. Let's move on to talk about about Ripple because Ripple is kind of interesting in this sort of a cryptocurrency context, right? Because a lot of Bitcoiners don't like Ripple too much, and uh, Ripple's often thought of as this sort of uh, you know building things for bank and and being sort of very regulatory friendly and and being a different system, I don't know if these uh, some of these accusations are so true. But uh, regardless, um, Ripple is is also a large company, right? I think they have about hundred people. They've raised uh, a lot of venture capital from from top tier venture capital firms, um, and it's quite interesting that even though they've sort of always explicitly been very regulatory friendly, very government friendly that they have been fined by FinCEN for $700,000. Uh, what do you make of that? I, um, I think it's uh, 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 what, what I would call a, a kind of shot across the bows. They're setting an exa uh, FinCEN, which is the, um, the money laundering regulator, federal money laundering regulator, think of it in those terms, um, uh, making a point. They're making a point because Ripple is uh, arguably the second largest um, virtual currency after Bitcoin, so it's something that will people will sit up and pay attention to. And uh, they're saying, do not treat our regulations and our laws lightly. 
If you look at the detail of this uh, find, what, 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 where, what the background is to it, it goes back to, uh, I think, uh, 2013. Um, or, uh, so you had um, uh, uh, um, FinCEN was one of the first regulators to, to issue some pronouncements on, uh, on virtual currencies. And um, and basically said, you know, it's 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 like money transmission. So treat yourself as a money transmitter, and uh, the effectively the the, the so-called Bank Secrecy Act uh, applies. Now, Ripple started um, s um, um, engaging in what would be caught by that money transmitter uh, law, or the, the money transmitter provisions of that law. Um, back in, uh, I think it was around March 2013. And uh, a couple of weeks after it started doing that, uh, FinCEN actually came out with this, this announcement of its interpretation. And patently, Ripple did take note of it because about six weeks later, it, it stopped um, those activities. So these uh, infringements of the law these breaches actually took place in March and April 2013. Um, Ripple Labs set up a, a separate company, XRP2, and started, sort of restarted its activities in the summer, I think July or August time, and clearly had the intention of doing it properly but started engaging in the transactions before it had a money laundering system in place, its procedures in place, which not having them in place was a breach. And uh, before it had appointed a, um, a, 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 a compliant, chief compliance officer and so on and so forth. Uh, and in fact, I think it took several months to hire someone in that role. So all the while, even though it was in, on the face of it was its intention to, to to sort of follow the law. It kind of thought that you know it didn't really matter, or at least, that, at least that's the way that it uh, comes across in those early days. And there's a salutary lesson in that for other startups in this space. So yeah, they did react to the um, to the uh, to the FinCEN ruling. It did react um, uh, appropriately and stop its activities, but not fast enough. And when it restarted in a different guise, it obviously had the intention of doing it right, but, and, but instead of getting the things in place first, didn't do it. And along comes Finson a couple of years later and said, hey guys, we found you you, you were in breach here. And, um, and a couple of other uh, issues that they should have dealt with in a particular way, transactions that they refused to right. do because and they look so suspicious. The, the implications of that, of course, are because you know Ripple didn't do this exactly the right way, although they were trying to do it the right way. Uh, if you look at the, the space of Bitcoin cryptocurrency companies, I am quite sure that uh, a wide number, if you know, certainly the vast majority, if not all of them have committed similar infringements. Does that mean we can expect FinCEN to go start going after a lot of other companies with similar, uh, similar fines and similar uh, charges? I, 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 I certainly don't rule out the possibility. Um, obviously, it has less impact the second and third time than it does the first time. It's had a lot of impact, and it's made um, serious businesses sit up and think about it. Um, this is why I say I think it's really, uh, and they're trying to set an example. They're trying to get the message across um, that you need to follow the rules and you need to do it before you start engaging in any transactions. And so you need to think about all of these things and be properly advised before you start operations. The, the I agree thing, with you, a lot don't. Yeah, the other thing I was wondering about, so it, it seemed like one of the things Ripple was doing, they were selling XRP, right? So Correct. one of the things, for example, they sold some XRP to Roger Ver. Uh, Roger Ver didn't uh, comply, uh, send them the identity document, of course, yeah. they knew who Roger Ver was, so, but regardless. Um, so, and, and they got fined for that, right? That's like an infringement. 
Now, one of the things that was done quite a lot in 2014, and to some extent also this year, were these coin sales, right? Where companies started uh, some coin, Ethereum, Factum, Gems, and others, uh, and then they sold them to whoever wanted to buy them for Bitcoin, right? There was no KYC done on any of these. Does that mean we can expect um, FinCEN to go after these companies for failing to do KYC during those crowd sales? Well, of course, it's not just KYC, and I need to make this point. Or not having an anti-money laundering policy. Yeah, the provisions are much broader than just checking who you're doing business with at the start. There are a lot of ongoing obligations and a lot of um, uh, procedural obligations and um, indeed uh, uh, having correct personnel. Um, so all of those things come into into play. Um, th 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 will we? Say, you, you're trying to draw me out on whether whether or not I think FinCEN will go after others. I think there is a strong possibility that um, uh, they may attempt to go after some of the larger, better known names um, in order to make a point. I think there's a strong risk of that. They may take the view that they've got the message across with uh, with Ripple, and so um, so long as people pay heed to that and do it differently from now on, they might uh, they might not invest so much time in investigating other infringements. But it's generally believed that they certainly have investigations underway, facts before them that are uh, uh, that, that, that suggest that, that that they might or could go after other people i think one worrying point here is that if you subsequently uh, say registering with fincen or any of these other agencies particularly in the us you of course opening your books on all the things that you did in the past and by uh, you know, by definition, you're kind of exposing yourself to the risk of being uh, fined for past infringements, even though you're doing it right now. It's generally felt that Ripple were only fined or fined only as much as seven hundred thousand uh, dollars, which, with a you know, with somebody like FinCEN, is actually considered a, a light fine. Uh, there were some other provisions that they had to follow, including making some changes to um, the Ripple system um, and also to the procedures in relation to Ripple Trade. Exactly. I, I forgot uh, to bring that up because I saw that as well. It said enhancement of the Ripple protocols. Uh, do you know any anything about the specific nature of those? Um, I don't think... Uh, they've been published in any detail, so I think we can speculate. There have been one or two observations about changes that have been made, but uh, essentially um, you have all sorts of rules about um, the information that needs to flow with the transaction and about linking transactions to individual parties. So one of the observations has been that Ripple trade was quietly sort of um, stopped, for certainly for new business, this is um, the non-institutional, the, the sort of personal, personal lines trading, uh, individuals, and um, uh, and uh, I think they just put out a statement of quite recently indicating that they were suspending new uh, sign-ups uh, whilst they uh, improved their system. So I guess you can kind of put two and two together and say that that's uh, connected with. Uh, that may have been one of the detailed requirements, um, and and certainly that's something that I I think we should be more concerned about, because here you have a regulator who's saying you've got this stuff that's um, uh, that's decentralised. Well, of course there are questions about the extent to which Ripple meets the sort of de de decentralised decentralised um, approach. Um, so. You know, that Ripple's a good one to go after. Uh, it would be much harder to do this with, with Bitcoin um, and others. Um, and it's trying to influence the, the nature of the, of the protocol, the nature of the system, the anonymous or pseudonymous nature of it by tr getting it changed in order to conform to the, um, uh, the, 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 the anti-money laundering frameworks that already exist. 
um, bring it, if you like, into line with the existing controls that, say, banks and other financial institutions have to follow. So let's, um, before we wrap up, uh, move on to a topic which is a bit closer to home for us, which is the uh, uh, the case of VAT. Uh, a few months ago, we mentioned this on, I think, I believe it was the last time you were on, the European uh, Court of Justice is currently, uh, I mean, there was a case at the European Court of Justice that was brought on, I believe, by a Norwegian or a Swedish, a Swede, a Swedish uh, uh, gentleman. Yeah. A Swedish gentleman. Uh, and the question is, Will Bitcoin transactions uh, be subject to VAT? That is, will you be charged VAT when you buy Bitcoin? And will the commissions uh, that exchanges make also be subject to VAT? Can you tell, give us an update on that? Just very, um, very briefly, um, the case is a very specific case about uh, the VAT, whether or not there's VAT on exchange commissions in Sweden in relation to a particular business. Um, that was run run by a single guy, uh, David Hedquist. And he and the, the tax authority in Sweden couldn't agree. It went to the Swedish courts and they couldn't work out whether or not it was subject to the kind of financial services um, uh, and payments exemptions that exist in the VAT rules which apply throughout the whole of Europe, uh, the whole of the EU. And so they referred the case to the highest uh, court in Europe, the European Court of Justice, for a decision on interpretation of this, these exemptions. Um, this case started nearly a year ago and uh, has gone through various stages. It's significant now because it had an oral hearing, so the Swedish uh, tax people and Mr. Henquist's lawyers and um, other interested parties, so a couple of European states, Germany and uh, Estonia, um, gave some input, and the European Commission, which is kind of the, um, uh, the civil service and government in that sense uh, of the European Union, also made a submission and put these, what it believed was the case, or they individually believed were the case, um, to the judges. Now, what's interesting about the European system is that a single advocate general issues an opinion uh, shortly after the case is heard, and this uh, opinion is going to is 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 um, um, uh, going to come out three days is expected three days after the uh, this is being recorded. So by the time uh, it goes out, um, there likely will be this opinion on the table. It's not binding. The judges then consider that opinion, and they can take months, um, many months sometimes to do that. So it's not definitive, but st statistically, uh, the opinions are more often followed than not. And why this is interesting is that in order to decide whether or not the v it's subject to VAT, one may have to decide what is this stuff in the first place? You know, what is Bitcoin? What are virtual currencies? because they obviously don't fit, they weren't uh, thought about, dreamt about, even when VAT laws were made and when these exemptions were written. And um, there's a strong possibility that, that, that out of this case will come the unintended consequence of defining what in law virtual currencies are. And that may go beyond virtual currencies to um, other blockchain uh, fuel, for want of a better expression, um, so that 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 has obvious implication, potential implications, uh, and of course it could be that they say, well, this stuff is just like a commodity, and if it's like a commodity, then it, it's subject to VAT itself. So then you could have a situation where, when you buy a cup of coffee and you pay for it with Bitcoin, you're engaging in some kind of barter transaction. So you know, I, 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 I'll take my cup of coffee and uh, pay you in a carrot. And, um, uh, and so there would be VAT on both sides of the transactions. So if you think there are 28 member states, the European Union is the largest economy in the world at the moment. Uh, it, um, uh, it, it would have a very significant impact if, that, if it were decided that this stuff was a commodity or goods. Uh, and even if it was decided that it was um, like financial type instrument and therefore 
um, you know, not goods, not subject to a barter transaction, um, it might still they might still rule that the an exchange's commissions or margins are subject to VAT, and that would make a European exchanges um, highly uncompetitive in a global market. So there are all sorts of significant implications that might be coming down down the uh, highway soon. Yeah. So well, Sean, thanks so much for joining us today. It was it was a pleasure talking about all these topics. Uh, I think it was very interesting, very important. It's not the most uplifting topic to cover, no. uh, but it's certainly important as as participants in this cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, blockchain movement to understand where things are going and how they'll be affected by these various uh, regulatory attempts. No doubt, the real world is catching up with uh, with innovation. That's uh, and and may constrain it in some way or may help it. We shall see. Absolutely. So to listener, thanks so much for joining us. So we put out new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to it on uh, your favorite podcast app, Android or iOS, or you can subscribe to it on SoundCloud. You can also watch the YouTube videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter BTC. And if you like the show and you're sort of a loyal listener and you want to help us, then you can do one thing, which is leave an iTunes review that helps uh, new people find the show and that helps us thus produce more and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.